Hey, hold the phone for a second. Give me a minute. You hear it said on this podcast and in other places that we need to support those who support us. Well, trust me, I've seen it with my own eyes. I've experienced it right here on the podcast. Those big companies don't give a rip about you and I. They just care about dollar signs. So when we need archery supplies, we really need to be looking towards the mom and pop shops across this country who support what we do and have been there for years. Take Terry and Barb over at the Footed Shaft. For over 10 years, they've been giving back to the traditional archery community. They give a rip about our passion because it's their passion too. So when you need archery supplies, and if you're not in the Rochester, Minnesota area where their store is located, jump on the website, www.footedshaftllc.com, or drop down in the show notes and smack that hyperlink. They've got everything you need from points, glue, broadheads, arrow shafting, whether it's wood, footed shafts like their namesake, carbon, aluminum from companies like Beeman, Gold Tip, and Black Eagle. So go check them out and support those who really do support our passion. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to this week's episode of the Stickbow Chronicles, brought to you by Black Widow Bows. It is Monday. Well, this is Monday when you're hearing it. It's actually Tuesday. I'm sitting here having a beer, celebrating my Friday, looking at Blake's ugly mug. What's going on, buddy? Ugly? Well, it was you scowling don't throw again. Rocks, don't throw rocks if you live in a glass house. <laughs> you should, somebody should have taught you that at the young age. <laughs> Well, you you can only see from the chest up. You can't see my legs. Well, that's all I need to see, old son. <laughs> oh, that's good stuff. What's up, buddy? <laughs> oh, you know, same you, old, same old. You were showing me some. Uh, you were dangling some. Um, that's the wrong term. Yeah, you you. Yeah, that's no. the wrong term. Let me back up a little bit there. <laughs> you were holding up some components. Uh, the screen uh, when we we're doing that intro. I was not, I was not dangling. <laughs> there was no dangling. <laughs> Negative on the dangling. Uh, no, I, I, I you, finally uh, I think I got my components uh, all dialed in as far as weights and everything with the with that Snyder core system on those deep impacts. So I'm I'm gonna shoot a 220 grain or 225 grain Snyder core wide solid with a 25 grain weight screwed on the back of it. So that'll make it 250 grains and then uh 25 grain collar. So total 275 up front. And it's, uh, yeah, I was shooting bear shafts at, at 35 and 40 earlier and they're shooting, shooting great. So I think Man. that's what I'm going to roll with. I, I had not planned on discussing this, but, uh, we, we almost had an altercation on Easter, um, uh, was over visiting my, uh, we we always do um, holidays with uh, our dear friends uh, over in Clark Fork. Pete Weatherford, he owns the Arrow Works. Uh, he's he's been on the podcast a couple times. You know, he's old school, um, not 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 old old school. You know, I mean, he is into high end arrows and and all that stuff. Really into tuning. But the subject of front of center came up and weight front of center, and you know, like I like he raises his eyebrows when I. Tell him like total weight is two twenty five up front. He's like that's too much, you know. So then I was talking about you know like I, I think Aaron said he's shooting three hundred and 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 Pete's getting pissed and he's got having a coronary and I'm like it's so it's just kind of funny. It felt like well a, I I think that well and I shot two twenty five up front for I don't know a year or two. I shot on my compound you know one fifty to one seventy five up front and. I think there's a good happy medium in there if you're anywhere in between that 15 and 20 percent range or 14 and 20 percent range that's that's a good place to be and this depends on the tune and the arrow for me um i have a total arrow weight goal and i'm going to kind of uh you know select a shaft based on that and a point weight based on that and usually it's going to be between 225 and 275 up front and that seems to kind of be my my happy place anyway well, things are spiraling out, spiraling out of control there on Easter, and then we got it talking about gap shooting versus instinctive, and nothing, nothing good was happening. 
It was a quiet meal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, I was defending gap shooting. Like, get that oh, scar. Oh, yeah, please. Please, I don't you care. Lie and no, you shoot whatever. You- I don't care how people shoot. He was getting his dander up, though. He was ready to throw yeah. down. I think he threw a piece well, of ham at me. Uh, I can show him the benefits <laughs> sometime. Well, don't get riled up. There's no need to get riled up. It's all funny. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I I'm glad to finally uh, have some uh, components and and stuff dialed in, and I, I I'm gonna still not 100 percent sold. I'm a little bit heavier on this arrow build than I would like to be, but um, I'm gonna give her a go because it, it's about I don't know 600 610 grains, 615 grains is gonna be right around where it's at, and. That's a little bit heavier than I would like to be, but I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a try because it is super 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 dead quiet shooting that heavy of an arrow. Uh, Do you see those knives that um, that uh, Bill had made for us? Yeah, yeah. No, we can tease that a little bit. Uh, Bill uh, over at Iron Will was uh, nice enough to engrave a bunch of knives for us with the the new Stickbow Chronicles logo, and uh, we're gonna put those puppies up for sale, probably do a couple giveaways with a couple of them. And, um, they're the, uh, the K one knife, ultralight knife. They weigh one ounce. Um, are you kidding me? One ounce? Yeah. Fixed blade knife weighs oh, one ounce. It's, gosh. and, and no, they're, they're awesome. They're legit. There's no doubt. It's, uh, and it doesn't feel like a, in your hand anyways, especially if you put like the paracord grip on it or the G 10 scales on it, which, you do that, it's heavier than an ounce, but um, it doesn't feel like a little wimpy knife. It, it feels like a, sure enough, you know, good quality fixed blade knife. And um, no, I've I've loved them. Um, I went through uh, my whole mule deer this year and then uh, an elk also, a buddy of mine shot an elk while we were up there and went through that whole thing. And uh, I think I touched it up about three quarters of the way through that elk. I had to pull out the, the sharpening stone and touch it up quick. And no, they're, they're awesome knives. And, um, yeah, we'll, we'll have those things up for sale. Got the Stickbook Chronicles logo on them. So yeah, that looks super Thanks cool. to Bill. Yeah. Big, big shout out to Iron Will. Appreciate it. Hey, um, I, I got to mention, um, Steve Angel, uh, outdoors, mm, traditional outdoors podcast. Uh, he's over in Georgia. Great group of guys over there in Georgia. Him and his uh, his wife has been has been sick for the last few months, and you know I mentioned I think on on a podcast like uh, we did a little bit ago that kind of got overwhelmed this year with um, you know requests or, or seasons right so like it, it, all this stuff was coming down this year about um, attacks on seasons on archery seasons on bear hunting and and on and on and it was a little bit overwhelming but I I gotta say also was the amount of people um, that were getting sick. And then we were really, you know, we wanted to help. You know, when Cody uh, Roblin came up, we did a GoFundMe. It was awesome. Uh, but there's, it just seems like in the community, like there's been so many people that, that uh, you know, got sick and, and, and needed help. We wish we could help everybody. Um, uh, the trish, There's a couple of traditional groups in uh, Georgia that I got together. They're doing a raffle uh for a, a bow for Steve and, and Lori Angel. Um, like I said, Lori, Lori's got some big, big medical bills uh, coming coming up. And so if you go to our uh, Facebook page, there's a link there for these uh, raffle tickets. They're 10 bucks. And you know what? If half of our listeners went and bought a $10 ticket, uh, it would help tremendously. And you got a great shot at, buy, at uh, winning this, this bow. Uh, so please, uh, if you're part of uh, traditional uh, Georgia traditional bow hunters, um, you know, go to that website, like I said, or go to our Facebook page and uh, buy a raffle ticket. Steve is a great guy. He's done a lot for the traditional community, so we'd love to help him out. Absolutely. No, I mean, it. it's uh, it's pretty uh, pretty cool to be able to, to use our platform to try and get the word out on stuff like this. And um yeah, happy to help. Uh, make sure and 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 like Rob said, go to the Facebook page, get your raffle tickets, ten bucks. That's uh, you know, can and a half at you. Uh, maybe quit for a day, go get your raffle ticket. 
Matter of fact, stop listening right now and go into the show notes and I will have a link there somewhere. Well, it'll be in the show notes, but it'll take you to, uh, whether it's the Facebook page or where, but it'll take you to those tickets and just buy one ticket if you can. Appreciate it. Yeah, so so this week we uh, had you had Mike Mitten on. I was Dude. not able to make that one. I know. And uh, big name, super uh, bummed. Yeah, super bummed you weren't there. Me, me as well. He's uh, he's done a ton of stuff. Um, you know, I, I mean, I guess most notably, as far as I know, anyways, is is solo filming and solo hunting moose. Yeah. Um, and and really wreaking havoc. And he killed some really, really big whitetails too, but the, the moose solo hunting moose and, and getting it all on film is, man, that's, that's next level stuff. And on top of that, doing it with a, with a stick bow. He's talking like 20 days solo in Alaska. I mean, that's, that's Monty Browning level. Well, and man, I, I can say with, with what limited experience I have solo, it is a mental Freaking, oh my gosh. especially if you don't have cell service. Um, if you don't have cell service, you can't talk to kids every day. You can't, I mean, it is a mental, it's mental warfare with yourself after about day five, day four. Uh, man, it, it, it really takes some serious mental toughness to, and I'm not even talking, that's not even figured in the elements or the weather or the hunt, nothing like that. It's, it's just a mental grind to literally not have anybody to talk to for that, that, that long. Dude, I don't I don't like myself enough to be with me for three days. I get sick of myself. Yeah, that's pretty much what it amounts to. <laughs> that's why solo hunting is is hard for people. And I mean, I you know I've done a few you know four or five day trips, and by day four or five, I'm ready to go talk to somebody, I'm ready to make a phone call. If you're not familiar with Mike Mitten, um, go to Herd Bull uh, Productions. Uh, just Google Herd Bull Productions, and you'll see uh, he's got his latest um, video out um, is uh, Solitude, Seeking Solitude. And uh, I, I got that and watched it. Great videography. I mean, and he was also part of Brothers of the Bow, and that's the uh, Wenzel Brothers. And a whole bunch of those guys got together and several years ago did what was called Primal Dreams. Uh, it, it seemed like it was kind of groundbreaking at the time because it, it just tells so much of a story uh, and it's just a high level of, um, you know, photography and videography. Uh, it, it, it's just it's a very artistic. Um, and then what he did in Alaska with Seeking, Seeking Solitude, like Blake said, is uh, several uh, moose hunts put together. Um, yeah, the guy's the real deal. I mean, uh, it, He's, you know, um, to fly back there and to get her done by yourself. Uh, and he's been doing it on for a, a long moose. time. Yeah, on a, We're not well, talking if, about an elk if you or see, a mule deer. If you see moose. the size of this dude, uh, it, it you know, it would be like me with an elk. So to put it in perspective, uh, he's a big, big dude. <laughs> uh, but you, you talk about humble and quiet spoken. That was one thing that struck me. Like in today's world, you know, if somebody was to do that once, it would be plastered all over uh, uh, the internet, you know, and, on on how great they are and, and you know, what the accomplishment was. But, you know, to, to get uh, Mike to talk about himself is kind of difficult. So. No, I mean, I, that probably just speaks to what kind of guy he is. I mean, he, he's uh, – I'll be excited to listen to it and uh, kind of get his take on all of it. But, I mean, that's uh, – you know, getting in, into the traditional community, that's one of the first names I heard was was Mike Mitten. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to, to listening to it. Uh, and he was he was friends with Bart Slar, Slayer. Um, that name ring a bell? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So yep, he was, he was I've seen that name, with, name a bunch. Yeah, he was friends with Bart and worked with South, I think, last year, two years ago, building a commemorative uh, bow to Bart. And uh, I think they built 10 of them. Yep, I saw that. So, uh, yeah, Mike Mitten. I think you, I think everybody will enjoy this uh, for sure. And uh, another thing, Mike and I are both on the board of Comptons, uh, and and I, you know, Mike has been on the list to get on this podcast for quite a while, and it's kind of spurred me on. I'm like, man, I uh, probably a good way to get to know a guy is get him on the podcast. We'll shoot the breeze. So it was fun. 
Well, you got anything else you want to touch on before we pop off this? I don't, other than look for our eye hunt close trad kill 2021 coming up. Yep. That's about it. You want to hit the sponsors, buddy? Or am I going to put you on the spot there? Yeah, thanks to the sponsors. We've got Kafar International, the Footed Shaft, Backwoods Grind Coffee, Selway Archery, and of course, Black Widow Bows. Thanks for listening. Uh, whatever you're listening to on or whatever app you're using, uh, subscribe. Leave us a positive review. If you're going to leave us a negative one, just uh, we'll hunt you down. Yeah, yeah piss off. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, thanks for listening and uh, go support our sponsors. They support us. And uh, yeah. Thanks. Cool beans, man. That's all I got. All right, let's get out of here. Roger out. Hey, Mike, how's it going today? Oh, perfect. Uh, nice, cool morning uh, in uh, March or April, I guess. April yeah. First, I guess. <laughs> I, yeah, I didn't even uh, play a joke on my wife yet, but it's coming. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Where are you located yeah, sometimes at? Sometimes those backfire I'm oh, in uh, northern Illinois, right in the northeast corner of the state where I live, right up a mile from Lake Michigan and a couple miles from the Wisconsin border. Did you grow up there? Uh, yeah. I was born in uh, Lafayette, Indiana, but when my dad was going to Purdue, but we moved here when I was like one year old. And I grew up uh, about. 400 yards from the house that, I'm, that I live in now. No kidding. <laughs> I bought as an adult and raised, uh, raised my kids here and stuff. So I'm still in the same house after 36 years, I guess. Pretty cool place to uh, grow up as far as like, you know, fishing, chasing critters. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're on the loose suburb. So halfway between Chicago and Milwaukee up against the lake here. But uh, I get out of here quite often. I uh, used to hunt around here in these counties, uh, the northern, northeast counties of Illinois, were bow hunting only, um, and they still are. So there's some bow hunting, but it's all uh, suburbia type stuff now, mostly, you know, at progress. But uh, I usually, my, and I've hunted like, I don't know, eight or 15, I don't even remember, 15, I guess, different counties in the state of Illinois. But uh, focus now on my own property that I own with my brother. So it's about a a three-hour drive. So I get out of here and get over towards uh, the Quad Cities uh, where I do most of my hunting now for whitetails. Well, I uh, I had a guest on. I was racking my brains trying to think who it was. They were obviously from Indiana. But uh, they um, they pointed out several times during the podcast the rich history of um, bow hunting and and, and uh, um, traditional archery that Indiana has. I mean, you guys mm-hmm. you guys get passed up sometimes, but uh, uh, Fred Asbell, uh, M. R. James, um, you threw out a couple other names. Yeah, all the guys that. Uh that I grew up with reading about and and uh, listening to. <laughs> did you, uh, did, uh, were you always a passionate bow hunter, you know, growing up? Was it like something you strove uh, for? Yeah. Yeah. As a kid, you know, we're kind of like in loose suburbia where I live. It's, uh, so there's ravines and, and woodlots and things around the house, but we couldn't shoot guns. So we would run off into the ravines and chase rabbits and stuff with, with homemade bows and things. But then uh, I think when I was in fifth or I think sixth grade, my dad gave, I have four brothers and two sisters and uh, had, and he gave three of us boys all uh, bear, tiger cat uh, recurve bows for Christmas. So started uh, shooting those, and uh, the neighbors would look out their windows and see us <laughs> sneaking around in the thickets by their house trying to get a rabbit or a squirrel or something. Or a lot of times it turned out to just to be, you know, sparrows and stuff. You know, we had we didn't know what a flu-flu arrow was, but <clears throat> to be safe, we would. Uh, my dad uh, got rubber like rubber corks, and we would drill them out and glue them on the end of our arrows. And uh, so that's what we would shoot the shoot at the sparrows and 
birds with as young kids. <laughs> <laughs> Remember doing a doing a uh, seminar and a, a kid asked me um, what was the first like animal I shot, you know, and I kind of <laughs> didn't want to bring it up, but you know. But I made a pretty good shot on a, you know, on a, a robin, you know, <laughs> and uh, but that's what you know. That's the hunting nature in the, in us kids, and then it grows into adults, and then you realize that you know, a lot of those things are off limits, and they shouldn't be shot unless you eat them, and all that stuff. So that all comes, you know, with uh, with time and maturity, and it doesn't take long when you bring home the wrong thing and my dad will yell at us, you know, you better eat that now or this type of stuff. <laughs> so then we uh, focused on rabbits and things. But yeah, the passion for archery kind of started then. And, and I was in Boy Scouts and earning merit badges in archery and stuff. And actually the archer, archery, uh, the guy that did the merit badge um, sponsor uh, lived in the house that, that I bought. So, I mean, I got my archery merit badge when I was, I don't know, 12 or 13 years old or something in the yard that I now own that I have a deer target in that I shoot in almost every day. So it's kind of... Oh, that's an awesome. We're, we're traditional guys. We always think about history and stuff. But uh, and my dad owns uh, some property up in northern Wisconsin that we bought in uh, 1970. So it's uh, 60 or no, it's like 76 acres and we bought another five so it's about 80 acres surrounded by 400 square miles of Chiquamagan National Forest you know it's 20 miles by 20 miles of of uh, government land and uh, you can hunt right out from the, right out from the house so that's mainly where I started most of my uh, big game hunting and deer hunting it was up in uh, uh, Taylor County Wisconsin I, I I have to uh, I have to back up for a minute. I'll be uh, I'll be uh, it'll be scorched earth policy. Uh, somebody realizes I left out Fred Bear. Uh, he was born in Indiana, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Oh man, Brian Burkhart, Jim Mack out. Yeah. They'd all kill me. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, growing up, yeah, those guys will knock the heck out of you. <laughs> <laughs> the bear of fish. I go on Facebook sometimes, but always at the top of the page, always one of the first posts is uh, Brian or Jim or those guys, and they're always, you know, uh, touting their bows and talking about Fred and stuff most of the time. <laughs> the, they're, they're Fred Bear supermodels. They're, yeah. They're, they're supermodels for uh, bear archery now. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I, I, uh, Mike, since I started this podcast, uh, you, you know, you get a list of people that you, you look forward to uh, sitting down and chatting with, and you were on that list, and one of the names, don't feel bad, there's other names on there that I've never gotten to, but uh, you and I both got elected to the board um, for Comptons this year, and so I thought, man, I, I better uh, give you a holler and get you on the podcast and we get to know each other. So congratulations yeah, on your uh, win. <laughs> oh, same to you. <laughs> it's not much of a election. Sometimes there's so many other people that are good. You kind of wish they would get on too. So but, uh, they'll, they'll all get their chance. It won't be on it too long. But uh, no, I've done a lot of uh, video and, and the articles and books and things. And it takes up a lot, a lot of time. So um, I would go to different banquets and things and uh, Compton's has a rendezvous in, in June every year. And so I was always there as a vendor, you know, and so I get to meet all the people and, uh, and my thing is kind of, I don't, uh, the, I don't really sell, I, I guess I sell videos and book, but I think of myself as se selling in inspiration, you know, so I get a lot of uh, repeat and a lot of kids come up to talk and I get to see them kind of grow up in the, in the sport and around archery and bow hunting and uh, those rendezvous and, and uh, different shows. And there's another one in Michigan, Barry and Springs, the, uh, the Kalamazoo, I mean, the, in, uh, in, uh, in Kalamazoo in, the, in January called the Expo, Trad Bow Hunting Expo. And uh, so you get to meet a lot of people. So, uh, Brian Burkhardt is the president of Compton's now, and he was asking, uh, was there any volunteers to get on the board with him? And so 
thinking about it for a few years and uh, decided it would be a good time to join his team type of thing and see what we can do. Well, he's you like know, a workhorse. Yeah. He's a workhorse. <laughs> yeah, he is. He's good at, man, he's good at what he does. Um, and uh, I think he's going to be awesome. And he said his, the, he was looking forward to delegating. So he's got the right attitude yeah. too. Well, it's good. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. it, and I'll be honest with you. Um, you know, you say you've done a lot, you've done, you know, you've written books, you've put out, you were a big part of primal dreams. Um, you've had other videos out there and you sell inspiration or you create inspiration. And, and when, uh, I saw the list of, um, people running for the board and, and I was on there and I saw your name, I was like, holy smokes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was totally, uh, impressed and intimidated. I'm like, man, they they got me on there and they got Mike Mitten. <laughs> That's one end of the spectrum to the other. No, no, you're doing a great job. If you're uh, getting out there and tying us uh, all together and, you know, bridging the gap between the the old and the new, you know, reaching into the archery history with your, your podcast and things and bringing it to, to, uh, to the youth and as well as, um, uh, People that uh, want to get into traditional archery you did a, a good job with connecting between other uh, other weapon users, rifle hunters, and compound shooters, or what ha- what have you. And uh, uh, we can do what we what we what I do and do what we do. But uh, guys that run the podcast like you and and the push guys and uh, several others can you know bridge that gap and reach more of a customer base, so to speak. Yeah, I appreciate that because uh, um, there has been um, just this mon or a, you know a tidal wave of uh, of new uh, people getting interested in trying out stick bows. So, uh, and I, I kind of feel like I, sometimes I fall in the middle, no man's land, because I don't really consider myself one of the old guard, and I'm certainly not yeah. one of the young pups. So, um, you know, being able to uh, you know, we'll talk to you guys like you and, you know, uh, we mentioned MR James earlier and, and some of the other guys and, and say, Hey man, remind them like, Hey, these are the guys that, uh, got us where we are today. And, and, uh, so it's, mm-hmm. it's cause it's going to be there. Yeah. You mentioned, uh, primal dreams, which is a two hour almost feature film. You know, we sold it as DVDs with Gene and Barry Wenzel and my, and my two brothers that came out in 2005. But now videos like that are hard to hard to get out there because everybody's on electronic downloads and things. And uh, two hours seems like a long time on one subject. But folks will sit there and watch YouTube clips that are five to ten or fifteen minutes long, but they'll watch them for five hours or something like that. But hard to hard to capture them with a full length uh, you know video type of thing. But uh, so yeah, the, the media cer- certainly changed, and, uh, and and podcasts are part of that now. It seems, yep. Yeah, uh, f- absolutely. Um, is there any um, is there any plans on putting uh, Primal Dreams uh, a dig- on a digital version? Uh, yeah, it should be uh, already out there on on digital. Oh, is it? Uh, if you go to Brothers of the Bow uh, website, uh, you should be able to download it from there. I don't know if I say revolutionary is the right term, but you know when you guys put that out, uh, the the quality and and the context, the the context really, and I mean the message you you guys put out there with that was uh, uh, was unique. I mean uh, nobody was really um, nobody was putting that much thought and uh, I almost say emotion into a, a video. I mean that thing was that thing's awesome. So if anybody has not seen Primal Dreams. Um, yeah, go over to Brothers of the Bow website and uh, and get it because it's yeah. it's it's a work uh, of art I, for sure. My brother David did the, the lion's share, you know, of the work behind the you know the editing and pulling all that together. Whereas we were writers, Gene's a writer, and Barry had done videos hunting uh, October whitetails and in front of some of the first uh, production videos. But uh, he had been out of been out of it for a while. Um, through the the 90s and it came out with spirit of the bull i guess in maybe uh 1999 but we are me and my brothers are working on a video just sort of showing the the solo hunters aspect of hunting and with a more focus on nature because we did so much video work with scouting and stuff like that and so much 
focus on the animals that we tried to bring that together and we kind of did a promotional video for an outfitter in Alaska and stuff and we were showing it to Gene and Barry and kind of told them our concept and 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 uh, they're like you can't just uh, have that for yourselves or whatever you know you need to get this out to the public so then they uh, asked to join the join the team and that's kind of how uh, the the Wenzel brothers and the three mitten boys <laughs> the mitten brothers brothers of the bow is the the uh title or for our our production uh, crew brothers of the bow so and uh, it's mainly um Gene and Barry's their their website those two guys but i mean it's kind of spawned from that when we made the primal dreams and it's filmed in 11 different states and with the more focus on the wildlife and uh so yeah it was uh, uh a work of uh, passion, and you can imagine three brothers in a small <laughs> twelve by twelve editing room trying to get something done. You know, there's so many arguments, and, you know, because you'll say things to your brothers that you won't uh, that you won't say to a stranger, and uh, so it got <laughs> about uh, you know which scene and all that, and trying to keep keep egos down and stuff like that. But it came out really well. We weren't sure how it was going to be received. <clears throat> but uh, it really surprised us and took off. Are, are, are your other two brothers, are they uh, as big a boys as you are? Because <laughs> that'd be some big wrestling. Uh, my brother Mark is. <laughs> yeah, we're about, about the same. He, we call him Carcass. And David, he's uh, he's uh, not as tall or whatever, but he's he, he'll fool you. He's, real, he's a real scrapper. So he's a tough little guy, you know. Hate to have to wrestle him. <laughs> I can't imagine what uh, what your parents' grocery bill was <laughs> feeding <laughs> feeding you guys. Yeah. Um, uh, jump back to Compton's um, the uh, the rendezvous June seventeenth through the twentieth, uh, Barry and Springs. Yep. Uh, you gonna yep, make it? That's coming up. We didn't have one last year, but uh, this year it's a go so far. Yeah. Um, you get you're gonna you're gonna make it. Sure. Yeah. I'll, I guess I'm in the uh, merchandising booth uh, with Kenny. So, um, so we'll see how it goes. The first one uh, with the Compton team, I guess. So we're starting in the we're in the beyond the planning stages. So we're getting some uh, uh, fine tooth. Uh, 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 programs done you know there's a big focus on kids there and and brian was always part of um brian burkhart was part of uh that ch- uh, children's shoot and uh and the youth program there on that day uh, that event day and uh so i know that's gonna be a big focus for him still probably so uh, kids yeah what um uh You've been before. I mean, like, what is the attendance? Because I'm, I'm planning. I'm trying to get there. Um, you know, my work schedule is pretty crazy. Um, uh, what? How many people show up to this thing? Because I'm kind of an introvert. Uh, <laughs> I don't know the exact number, but it's multiple thousands. Oh my gosh! Weekend. Yeah, That's a lot cool. of them camp there and they come through for the day shoots. I mean, it starts on the 17th. You know, when you start shooting, there's I think five ranges or so five or six different ranges at the sportsman club there in near Berrien Springs um and uh they set up really well it's all it's real safe um so there's a camping area and then people come in and the big parking area for the day shooters so I mean I don't want to say it's beyond a thousand because that's our uh <laughs> gotcha Michigan, uh, uh <laughs> cut off for this event but uh it, it should, we're hoping for a real good attendance this year because everybody's hungry to get out there stretch their legs and get beyond this uh this covid thing it's an outdoor it's an outdoor event and uh, they plan to have uh, safety protocols uh in effect uh before we would cram everybody into the into the pavilion and uh they also have a an actual building where they eat breakfast and stuff. So, so there'll be some uh, modifications to those wow. facilities to to accommodate the the requirements of uh, the Michigan uh, uh, government and so forth that uh, oversee this stuff. So uh, we're going to try to be in compliance with them, and uh, 
hopefully we'll have a great event. But once you're outside, I don't know about you, but there's not usually too many people around me when I'm walking behind the targets looking for my arrows. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'll be the only one behind the targets trying to find my, <laughs> my overspray. <laughs> so, um, there will be a chance to social distance for sure, but uh, good campfire uh, talks and uh, at night you go through the campgrounds and uh, you just meet all kind of new people and stuff. And Of course, you're outside, so I mean, there shouldn't be any issues. Um, I can't imagine, you know, with, uh, that type of stuff with the virus. But uh, uh, yeah, you go in one. Somebody will have a Dutch oven cooking going on, and you know, you never know what you're going to have. Peach cobblers and stuff like that. Then you go to the next one, and they got they're famous for their steaks or something like that. You just get to meet a whole lot of people. So it sounds it sounds like a uh, archery tailgate party, bow hunting yeah, tailgate party. Yeah, with, yeah, and then they had the vendors booth, so you get to see all. That's where I was always at in the vendors booth, and uh, either with Brothers of the Bow or or my own uh, company, Herd Bow Productions. I would get a a booth space there and uh, sell books and videos and stuff, and get to meet everybody. But uh, yeah, uh, as as Fred Asbell will be there and his wife, uh, and they'll be selling all their stuff, and then all out all the bowyers and. Uh, Oh yeah, um, the vendors alone. Gary Brum and them guys, they Great Northern and uh, Black Widow bows. They have a corner usually, and just uh, St. Joe River bows, and just everybody. Man, yeah. He so have an outside. Comes up with an outside tent. He's got like a a big space all his own. Big Jimbo company. Yeah. Yeah, we've we talk, we get a lot of uh, questions about first bows, and you know, and uh, you know, how do I decide what I want? And, and we always say, man, if you can make it to a shoot, um, because even yeah. without vendors, you know, people are so willing to, hey, you want to try this bow? You want to try this bow? Mm -hmm. uh, sounds to me like that'd be the place to be <laughs> if you're uh, looking yeah. to see what you uh, what what uh, traditional traditional archery is all about. Yeah, we're kind of spoiled because of the proximity of it here in the midwest i know you're out in idaho and stuff and it's a long drive but uh, so they have the western ones but there's a, a tremendous amount of uh, bow hunting in wisconsin illinois indiana pennsylvania michigan ohio so i mean we get a big draw in tennessee so we get a lot of uh, folks within a, a nine hour driving radius that come up to that you know and uh, they look forward to it to it every year and uh, so I think they're going to be hungry for it this year since it was canceled last year. Uh, and so if anybody's uh, wondering and wants more information, uh, head over to uh, www.comptontraditionalbowhunters.com and uh, there's a flyer on there. And, and then uh, there's the dream raffle. That's going to be, uh, um, that's going to be drawn the 19th, is it? That Saturday night? Yes. <clears throat> Yeah, so. Saturday night the, the the big banquet, and they have guest speakers and seminar speakers there, and they'll draw that then. Awesome. And, uh, the dream raffle is hunts and bows, and then everything from uh, from out in the field to get your meat and everything into the freezer. So they have jerky makers and knives and freezer chests and so forth and grinders and vacuum sealers and everything so it's kind of neat to see them focus on you know the other end of the spectrum we mostly talk about how to kill something but uh, <laughs> looks with this they'll teach you how to preserve the the memories and the that meat and uh keep it for a long time with the delicious uh delicious protein that we get from the wild animals yeah so i don't want to leave anybody out but this uh, dream raffle uh, Saint, it's a St. Joe River bows. There's some uh, arrows from addictive archery, and then it's a hunt. Uh, Big Sky Outfitters for uh, antelope, and like you said, tons of Lem products uh, to you know dehydrators, vacuum sealers, all kinds of stuff. Oh, knives, dang, grinders. Yeah, you should be able to buy tickets uh, online as well. I think. Yep. So yep. Same website. If you can't make the uh, rendezvous. Yep. You don't need to be support, present. Uh, Support the cause. Yeah. Don't need to be present to win. Um, Herd Bull Production. So I called you the other day, and we were shooting the breeze. And uh, after that, I went over to Herd Bull Productions and got uh, your latest work, Chasing Solitude. 
that video you put out. Um, yes. Wow, man, that's awesome. I was, I was fired yeah. up to get in the back country sitting in my living room last yeah, yesterday, two days ago. Yeah. That's um, a moose hunting film that took a couple seasons. So I take you to three different mountain ranges in Alaska, in Alaska, solo uh, moose hunting. So I guess solo hunting is kind of what I've, I mean, what I'm mostly known for in my writings and, and stuff recently. I love white tails, but uh, I every year get out into wild places for the last 30 years, um, someplace alone for two to three weeks at a time, either the Rocky Mountains chasing elk or mule deer or, or up into Alaska uh, after caribou. Or, and I love hunting moose, so done um, – I think nine solo moose, uh, moose or bear, black bear hunts. And so been up there quite a bit. And, uh, so that's my chance. And it's kind of like when I talked about primal dreams, um, uh, it was the initial thing was kind of the solo hunting experience, but then kind of Gene and Barry, we, we took over that uh, project and kind of turned into something more broader. So this Chasing Solitudes movie, uh, took almost two hours about my moose hunting gets me back to the initial goal was, uh, uh, just a, a solo, uh, experience, self filmed. And my son did the editing for me. So I go to, uh, three different mountain ranges in Alaska and so, show you what it's like. So it sounds like you pawn off a lot of the editing to, to other people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You do all the fun stuff. You get it all the, the video and like here make something. <laughs> yeah. I like it. Yeah. And the filming is uh, is tough too without without the film, but uh, yeah, you need uh, like uh, primal dreams a couple of hundred hours of footage to make a 2-hour film and here it's not maybe not that much, but uh, a lot of footage and uh and I tell folks like they love the films and bring the uh, bring uh, the story to them and but uh, can you imagine what a hunter sees that that we don't get on film you know that's yeah. what i try to tell them you know so this is just a small small part of it you know and it's somewhat two-dimensional on the tv screen or whatever but when you see the the panoramic every day from your tent you know it's hard to uh, capture that but uh, you, the point is to get out there and uh, try to experience it yourself but uh no, I love uh, love hunting moose, and the, the solo thing is um, there's a huge mental side to that. And a lot of folks tell me that you know we do it, do our self hunts and so forth, but we just don't we don't go alone like you do that you've been doing. And, and as well, a lot of folks you know hunt this way. It's just um, you have to get past or some way harness or control the fear that uh, that is inherent in everyone, and. Um, and then you can go and, uh, you know, you try to do what you can, being prepared and so forth. But uh, once you got to that point, then the, the mental side is your, your drawback. And, uh, and you know, I talk about some of the benefits of it and uh, the hindrances of it in, in my writing and stuff. You know, you get a, an elk down and you can't find it. You know, it's always feel like, oh, I wish I had someone else here to, you know, give me a hand with this. <laughs> Or uh, if you get a, a giant moose down, you know, and you're three miles from uh, the landing strip or the pickup spot or the or plane will come and fly in to get your meat out, you kind of wish, maybe I wish I had somebody here with me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but beyond that, uh, um, it's kind of a spiritual thing. You go for a week to seven days or so without seeing anybody and it, it becomes uh, pretty spiritual into the second week or the third week in, in some cases depending on uh, how long I'm up there. So um, there's so much here to, to unpack. First off, um, you mentioned, you know, self-filming and capturing things that other people won't see. Um, <clears throat> I don't film and I don't take enough pictures, uh, but you, you, you hit the nail on the head for me because you know, I grew up on the East Coast, and I, I'll, I'll never be, um, uh, I'll never quit being uh, thankful and in awe of what I've gotten to do, living out in, out west and and doing things. And you know, I, I look at something, you know, whether it's a, a, whether it's an animal or a sunrise or you know sunset, just every day little things you see out there, and I always think, man, um, 
I I can't believe what I'm seeing here, and and I have no way of sharing it. Uh, so my hats off to people who are, are willing to uh, to do the self film and to bring it back uh, for ev- others yeah. to see and and to inspire other people. Yeah, for a lot of uh, things of this type of hunt, the Alaskan hunts, you're generally going to try to get away from everybody. You can do that with some kind of a four wheeler or a boat or something like that. But many of us just choose to get into a bush plane and get dropped off either a remote uh, landing landing strip on ground on uh, on hard tires or or uh, a float plane that land you on a lake somewhere and uh, they just take off and uh, as that that plane uh, goes out of sight you know and you find yourself alone there uh it's kind of like you went back in time it seems like you know because you have you know running water and shower here at home and all the things you just said take for granted well out there you know you can't take anything for granted and you have to work for everything so uh and just the amount of work it takes even to get and hunt and climb and and, and uh, try to try to i use a, a lot of calling but to spot and stalk a moose or call in a moose um it's just you know all the work with that and then remember oh you got to film this and film and uh the extra gear the filming and the camera gear and tripods and batteries and so forth is all part of the weight and you're kind of restricted to the amount of weight you know, that you can physically carry on your back is sometimes you don't always stay at the same spot where you get dropped off. You you pack out and make a camp uh, somewhere else where you can either improve visibility or get into where the game are or just the physical size of the plane you're coming in on. If you're landing on a, a tiny little runway, generally you're using a super cub and you're limited to the amount of gear you can take. Uh, some of the bigger planes, um, more expensive, but uh, a beaver can haul a lot of gear. And wouldn't be so uh, so bad to have have it when you're flying in on a beaver, or landing on the water somewhere. But uh, again, the bigger the lake, the bigger the landing strip, the more access, the yeah. more uh, the lack of remoteness. To me, you won't you might you may find uh, other folks around. Because what I do is mostly um, just try to get dropped off somewhere without using an outfitter. Um, so generally you're the only person around for, uh, I don't know, tens of, you know, hundreds of miles in some cases. So do you remember Maybe your first human, uh, do you remember your first solo hunt? Are you, are you, does that stick out in your, your mind with like, uh, Hey, I'm going to go do this by myself. Yeah, well, the first uh, one was I hunted alone was in uh, in Colorado, was elk hunting, and that's uh, you know you can leave uh, leave your home in Illinois or Wisconsin or Idaho or anywhere and drive to the trailhead. Sure. So with that, you know you want to be self reliant, and you kind of are when you when you go out west. Um, you're not depending on anybody. You can drive to the trailhead and get in. And uh, I would try to find a wilderness area and, and backpack in. Uh, the first time I used a, an outfitter who had a camp up the drainage, and uh, he took me in uh, up to close to his camp and then dropped me off into a small remote camp alone. And he was kind of skeptical about doing it, but anyway, I convinced him that I would be okay. And, um, um, I didn't get into elk right away right there, so then I ended up uh, moving the camp. I hiked all the way around to this one draw that I could drop into a a gorge where nobody was, and then I got into elk down in there, and uh, I shot a bull down in this hole, down in this drainage, and uh, he couldn't believe it. The outfitter eventually, you know, then I had to pack everything out, pack the elk out, up to the rim where he could get at me, but uh, on horses that was my first uh, solo hunt, and mainly it's um, you plan on something, you know, you're ready. The anticipation of the hunt is we get it all excited for, and then your friend or whoever your hunting partner is can't make it, you know, or backs out, and uh, that sort of sparked the first time, and then uh, after that I would hunt. Um, 
uh, Colorado and different states in Montana. And then in 1995 was my first uh, solo into Alaska. And again, I was planning on going down towards Cordova and hunting moose with a friend. And uh, there we were going to use boats to get us back into the area that the moose were uh, air boats actually. And, uh, but we flew down to Cordova and then found out that there's another flight we needed to get to where, uh, to where the camp was. But, uh, they said that the air boats were broke and then there was someone else there. And so we, our tr transportation was going to be really significantly limited and we wouldn't be able to get into the area that we wanted. There was real uh, um, cool uh, weather that was going on through the summer. So the glaciers didn't melt much. So then you didn't have as much water down in the flats to get you in there. So there's some complications. But anyway, to make a long story short, I decided after I flew from Anchorage down to Cordova, got down to Cordova, and, and I decided that uh, this wasn't for me, that uh, this wouldn't be a good way to spend my vacation, which was very valuable to me. <laughs> and so I was supposed to be there for two weeks, and then I had another a caribou hunt planned, you know, for the third week up in an area uh, that I was already plant that I had already been to in 1988. So I called that uh, pilot and said, uh, "Can you get me in moose hunting up near there where I was going to caribou hunt?" And then so I turned around out of. Cordova flew back to Anchorage and then uh, hitchhiked basically got a cab <laughs> that that drove me up to Wasilla but I needed to get to Willow Alaska so then from Willow um I hitched the ride in to Willow and ended up uh at this outfitter cuz he said uh, you know I'm making a gasoline run uh for some guys that are in the bush and you know and we stash fuel and so forth and uh and uh, bring somebody out that's caribou hunting and uh if you can get here if you can get here i you can come in with me <laughs> so i did everything i could to get there uh anyway so my first uh solo in alaska which is uh pretty uh pretty amazing then was in 1995 hunting moose and uh i think i saw uh 40 something moose sightings and Holy smokes. had some close encounters and things like that ended up not uh, killing one that uh, that trip but uh just a great experience so um your first trip you, you know your first trip into colorado um uh, and you come from illinois like like you're a midwest yeah. guy um not growing up in the rockies what about um uh, talk a little bit about the apprehension you know maybe the fear uh the anxiety of of uh you know, I mean, you'd never been around bears, right? And all we ever hear about is bad bear stories. Uh, how do you yeah. manage that? Um, well, basically it goes back to being a kid and, you know, kind of doing things on your own and being self-reliant a little bit, you know, uh, with your, your friends and brothers and so forth. So, I mean, I didn't have lack of a woodsmanship. I had already built quite a bit of uh, woodsmanship skills when I had – been black bear hunting in Canada, and, and uh, I had also gone to Alaska with a, uh, a group of us. Uh, four four of us went to Alaska in uh, in 1988. So my first trip alone hunting uh, the, the Colorado trip was in '94. So I already built quite a bit of um, woodsmanship, and then uh, during the '80s and the early '90s, I was and still am very passionate about whitetail hunting and trophy whitetails, mature bucks and stuff. So that itself kind of lends, uh, that activity itself lends it lends itself to uh, a solo experience. So I had spent a lot of time, you know, alone in the trees and alone hunting deer because everybody kind of had their own little spots, you know, because, you know, we didn't have big areas. We had 40 acres here and, you know, 100 acres over there. And, uh, so we brothers and I always kind of all had our own little spots to hunt and friends. And we didn't hunt too much in the big group areas because we didn't have a great big land tracks to go to go into. <laughs> so that kind of uh, made, uh, you know, uh, being alone and so forth uh, not, you know, I guess uh, – how did you alleviate the fear is kind of the question, and that's part of that. 
Also, I did a lot of uh, coon hunting, raccoon hunting with dogs at night. I did a lot of that at, uh, alone. I had some friends too, but uh, I did a lot of coon hunting at night. So, I mean, a lot of things go wrong and you're dealing with hauling out a bunch of raccoons and dog handling and all that. Uh, so when the Colorado trip started and I, I lost the hunting partner to go, because a lot of times you have to have certain points for certain units and all this type of stuff. So this was an over-the-counter unit that I could go to, and uh, I just went out there. It wasn't too fearful. Colorado was just mainly black bear and stuff, but uh, Alaska is a different story. And uh, in Montana, I hunted elk in Montana with my brother, so it, that's kind of a, a loose way of saying somewhere along the line I had enough woodsmanship skills to ward off uh, – the fear of mainly hypothermia and stuff like that, uh, that that is your main culprit when you're out in the wild places. But the, the animals, uh, it, um, I guess you just leave it up to God at that point, but uh, you get that, get that fear in the back of your mind, you know, and use it as caution. Try to turn that fear into caution and then uh, preparedness. Uh, if you're prepared as much as you can, then you just let it go. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> we were talking earlier, um, backpacking, like uh, not even solo hunting, but so many people are um, out west here. Uh, younger guys have gotten into the backpack, you know, extreme, getting back into the backcountry and, and that stuff. And, you know, recently um, doing a podcast with Steve Stiley from Getting Stickbo Close and watching your videos, and I'd read your book, um, you guys aren't gear junkies like gearheads um i think it's awesome to to, to see your videos uh, in um in alaska and you've got very affordable equipment i mean you're not you're, you're getting there and getting it done with with basic equipment uh, mm -hmm. and i don't that's yeah that, that's that's not the because norm today because <laughs> we're older than uh, than the most <laughs> folks and that's what we had at the time and we don't uh, a lot of us don't change and so, I mean, and and then you just get ready for your trip and and get your body in shape because I guess we were stupid. We carried giant packs of ninety pound packs of gear, <laughs> and now uh, with the technology, you don't need to do that. You can get by with much less, and and uh, all the all the lots of podcasts out there with uh, how to lighten up your load and all that, and. Uh, and but you have to you know you have to pay for that in some some regard um like this chasing solitude you know you just said i do it with uh, affordable equipment but um you see me wearing sick gear and all this type of stuff yeah yeah <laughs> faru tents and stuff but uh of course um i just wanted to put out the disclaimer that i was a, a sick uh, pro staff member when they first started I think in 2006, Sitka Gear started, and I joined in 2007. So I've been with Sitka as a consultant, um, on the, mainly on the traditional side, uh, our needs, and as a solo hunter for uh, uh, well, well over 10 years. So I didn't realize that. Um, and and you know, I mean, you make a good point. Like I never used high tech clothing until you know just a few years ago and i mean wow uh what a difference and i, and I will keep, keep yeah. using it you know i was always a wool guy i'll keep using it but yeah. so many people um whether it's their bows or their tents or their boots or their clothes it seems like um it seems like that'll hold them back well i can't go because i don't have this tent or i can't yeah. go because yeah. i don't have these boots man just get out there and, and do it because it yeah you know it, it doesn't that, that point is made pretty evident there's a chapter in my book called the list you know because i always make a hunting list a checklist of my gear every year and i keep losing it and everything so i just <laughs> wrote an article about it put the list in there so now if i want my list I just opened that chapter in my book, and then there's my list. You know, I got to <laughs> so I kind of did it for myself. But anyway, the point that I try to make at some of my seminars, I have this huge list, and everybody focuses on all the gear. And uh, for me, uh, you also need another list. You know, you need mental toughness and and self reliance, and uh, and more of the things on a, on a list over on this side, preparedness and so forth. 
on on an on the other shorter list, and if you can get those things achieved, then the big equipment list shouldn't be quite as important. Uh, for example, I would get, you know, a brand new pair of boots, you know, uh, Kenetrex or somebody, and I'd show my brother, I go, oh, look at these, you know, look at these fancy boots, you know, I paid $300 for these <laughs> these boots, you know, and uh, I can really go everywhere with these things, and my brother would look at them and said, oh, they they look pretty good. They look a lot better than what Fred Bear had, you know. <laughs> and uh, or I'd I I'd, I'd show him a new a new bow, you know. Uh, look at this tall tines bow. It's got reflex deflex. It's you know it's really going to zip the arrows out there. You know it's it's a you know, new thing by Brian Wessel. You know it's a great bow. Look at the feel of this thing. You know it feels like Paul Schaefer made it or something. You know it feels it's got a good feel to it. Look at this bow. My brother would look at it and say, "Oh, that that's pretty good. It's uh, it's probably quite a bit better than what the, the Native Americans had." <laughs> <laughs> so my point is, Fred Bear and all these old timers and uh, even Native Americans that lived off the land, they could get it done with uh, a lot a lot less technical equipment. And so I guess the point to try to make it to the new kids is. Um, uh, you don't necessarily need uh, all the fancy stuff to get out there, and uh, and that's why I guess if I didn't get old, I would still be <laughs> using uh, a lot of the stuff that I had, you know, when I first started in the in the 80s and the 70s. But uh, I got old, like most people, and uh, so I'm 62 now, to, and I just did a solo hunt last year, and uh, with the new with New, two new knees, knee knee replacement surgery that the year uh, that year, and uh, so I uh, and the camera equipment and things. So I need to cut weight, and so I I too am uh, looking at ways to have a smaller, lighter uh, uh, load on my back, getting into in, into places. Yeah, yeah. I just I'd hate to see um, you know twenty five thirty year old guy think that that's what you need is the uh, most expensive yeah. and and best equipment. Now, uh, 62 isn't old, but two knee replacements and, uh, and you're still going solo. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty promising for yeah. a couple of buddies that are getting knee replacements. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm still relatively young. I didn't, a lot of the dogma was, oh, you wait and suffer, suffer with your arthritis and your degenerated, uh, meniscus as long as you can, cause you only want to go through this once, you know, and so but after cortisone shots and things like that to get me through, I mean, I, I had knee scopes and all that stuff. And I remember packing out moose in 2017, uh, full load and everything. And you feel pretty good, but you're basically drugged up, you know, with your knees. They feel like brand new, you know. But then uh, once that cortisone and stuff wears off during the middle of, you know, you hunt moose in September, and it wears off in a few months. So now, in the middle of uh, in the middle of the rut in November, you're trying to climb <laughs> into your tree stands. And I'm kind of old school, so I still had uh, tree steps and things, and they're pretty spaced out, pretty far on some of these trees. And then you're you're doing a basically a one-legged uh, squat to get to the next step, you know, and everything's coming apart, you know. So I thought, well. I would get this knee done. I got one done in April and the other one done in December. So I recovered in December and then I was planning on maybe just doing a caribou hunt. But caribou hunting is, is tough to find spots sometime and I ended up not getting the right uh, pilot that I wanted. And um, so I ended up back going back moose hunting. I figured I guess I'm good enough to hunt caribou. I feel good enough to hunt moose. So nine months later I was in Alaska going up and down the hills uh, chasing moose again and I ended up seeing and calling in nine bulls or eight I guess eight bulls last year and uh, I didn't shoot one but uh, they have a size restriction and stuff like that on them and I called in this one bull blindly I could hear him uh, making a rut pit and stuff and grunting and carrying on and I got him to come in but I still couldn't see him so I had a shooting lane on either side of me and a big meadow to my left behind me so I mean, it was kind of like I had him good pinched and he was coming I could hear him coming there you know I was cow calling 
Carl and he, he calling and uh, and I uh, still couldn't see him. I know he's coming because it's just thick enough. And it's hard to imagine why can't you see the moose? He's yeah. he's 20 yards away, but I still can't see him physically. And that's how thick it is. It can be sometimes. But uh, anyway, eventually when I got a good look at his horns, his antlers, oh man, put the binos up. He's about 18 yards now and uh oh man he's only got two points on the brow side brow points and you need to have three for that unit so then you got all this anxiety and excitement and and uh adrenaline and everything going and at 18 yards and he steps out at uh, 12 yards from me broadside and you can't shoot because <laughs> he's uh, not a legal bull <laughs> But uh, you that, know, you need to be 50 inches wide. If they're turned sideways, it's hard to determine that. So you you couldn't shoot, you know. And so if I knew he wasn't, if I could see him ahead of time, then I know to you know lay the bow down, so to speak, and and grab the camera and capture it on film. But anyway, I didn't uh, didn't get either one. Just to have him like most uh, like 99% of the people do, just have it in 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 my memories and have it in our memories of that bull stepping out grunting. A drooling nose and uh, ra- uh, rocking antlers back and forth, and he's uh, 12 yards away. <laughs> well, that's that's one thing that really intimidates me about moose hunting in Alaska is making the call on those uh, spreads because they don't yeah. mess around up there. I mean, there, there's no mistakes. No. <laughs> yeah, no, they put a tape measure on it, and if you're 49 and a half or whatever, then got to be maximum outside spread on a square so it's got to be 50 inches in a lot of spots in a lot of units some units don't don't require that so if that's an issue with you then then like people ask how do you find a place in alaska well if that's your issue then you would then focus on an area that doesn't have the size restriction maybe initially until you get your feet wet or something but most of them for non-residents most of the units have a size restriction either on uh, brow points and and a spread of 50 inches do you and alaska strains they have other requirements too sometimes you think oh i can just grab the meat and put it in uh put it in bags and i can carry it out or whatever but some units uh you're not required you can't uh, uh remove the meat from the bone you have to bring it bring the bones out you have to bring them out on the quarter you have to quarter and bring out the front shoulders, the hind quarters, and all the rib cages uh, separate, intact. Um, the idea, I guess, is to less uh, wasted meat. But to us, it seems like you're, you know, you're discri- dis- discriminating against the the do-it-yourself hunter because that forces you to either have an outfitter that has either horses or. <laughs> Uh, areas that have motorized either boats or something like that to to capture it but uh, it can be done that's what happened in one year um well, you know, I have to bring out the animal uh, I've, I, a, I think that was orders. that was probably a product i'm sure it was a product of um you know uh people that were a little less um diligent about retrieving meat maybe yeah. more about oh, yeah. uh, the trophy you know and well oh, i'll take yeah. the back straps and a couple of high yeah. quarters and leave well, the we, rest well, but that would bring out tell us to bring out the meat you know again you have to bring out all the meat first so that that's a product of that you have to bring out all the meat before the antlers come oh really to camp you know so you could uh, bone it out and then once you got it boned and you put it in this pack size then you could adjust your back size if you can only carry 70 pounds or then you can have a lot of packs of meat that weighs 70 pounds versus, <laughs> you know, it makes more runs, but most of my packs are in the, the 90 pound range Oof, 80 to 90, a hundred pounds or over, uh, over range, um, just to reduce the number of trips. Yeah. Cause you're talking with a moose by yourself. I mean, it's, uh, a minimum of eight trips. It's probably more like nine or 10 when you're dealing with antlers and cape and stuff like that. You're talking about, roughly 10 trips uh for uh, a big bull you know a lot of guys will shoot you know you shoot a you know uh, a resident or or somebody can shoot a smaller uh, uh bull there's a big difference between a, a two or three year old bull that's legal for a, a resident and one that the non-residents are required to shoot because you're adding that much more maturity and you could be 
<laughs> three to five hundred pounds difference in size. <laughs> so I mean, some people. One guy shot a uh, shot a moose, and I happened to see it at the at the landing strip or at the pickup spot when when you're because a lot of times you're in a bush, and then the pilots will bring you into either a central area where they can get at uh, to get at uh, at your equipment and your moose and stuff with a larger a larger plane and so you might meet someone else out there in the bush anyway this guy had shot shot a moose and i kind of made a joke to him like man you know where's the rest of your meat you know <laughs> but he had the number of piles there but it just the, the bags it didn't look very big and then i you know you see the antlers and it's uh, you know 36 inches wide and it had it did have three points brow tine on one side, so it made it legal. But that's in my mind, it's just a lot younger bull, and you're dealing with it that that much less meat. But you're getting one of these big mature bulls. You're talking um, at least uh, 600 pounds of boned out meat. So uh, yeah, and for people listening, especially uh, back east, you might be able to throw 70 pounds in your back and, and think it's you know, I could do that. But now you're doing it 10 times. And uh, over that, uh, through that musk egg or up over a ridge or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what about going distance wise? <laughs> yeah. What about going? A lot of folks have like a one mile rule or something. You know, they don't want to shoot an animal more than one mile from their from their camp. But uh, I kind of never followed that rule. <laughs> <laughs> what about going back into a kill site time and time again and uh, yeah. and and bears? Uh, how do you mitigate that? Or yeah. For me, I mostly, um, first thing I do is get everything in the bags, get all the meat off the animal and get it in the bags. And then I move the game bags and anything I want to keep, which would be the antlers and probably the cape if I'm going to do any taxidermy. I do my own taxidermy, so a lot of times I'm bringing the cape. So anyway, the meat, the horns, the cape, and I'll pack it like two to 300 yards away from that kill site. You know, the draw of the bears is to that kill site initially. You know, they're going for the entrails, the smell, the, you know, the gut pile and all that. That's their initial draw. So your meat bags is cleaner, say it's more uh, sterile, <laughs> let's say. It's going to smell, but I mean, it's a, a lot cleaner. And then you don't have any control of where that animal drops where he goes down and but you do have control of where you put the meat so you put it on a little hump or a hill or some log or tree or something where you can physically see uh see the see the the cache uh, from a distance you know and I, I usually flag it up pretty good with uh, some flagging tape and stuff so i can see it really well too and then take a good mental note on how the bags or um, the meat bags are positioned and stuff so every time you come back you stage up and glass uh, glass that spot ahead of time for a little bit to make sure nothing's there and usually if a bear comes in on your cash he's going to you know round up the bags or he might just take a bag and run off but a lot of times they'll they'll start to mound them all up put dirt over them and make a big pile and you can generally see if it's been any uh any activity there so by doing that it helps with your mental side of you having to go back and that's usually I carry a firearm a sidearm uh, in my pack and I'll have that out and uh, and uh, as I go in and and, uh, and retrieve the meat and uh, after that you're yeah you're kind of like a walking bear bait you know with this, this big hunk of bloody moose is what they want you know and uh, I've had bears come into camp but without any meat there, without having a kill there, they're generally um, uh, not real aggressive or something. They're more curious than anything. But so basically, they're not really after your freeze-dried mountain house and your little Roman noodles and stuff like that. That's not really what they're after. But if you've got, you know, you know, six hundred, seven hundred pounds, six hundred pounds of uh, moose hanging there by your by your pickup spot, which a lot of times is near the landing strip or lake, is usually where your camp is. You're kind of breaking all the rules. You're bringing the meat and so forth to the camp. And then at that point, um, in the old days, I wouldn't do anything. You just wait for the pilot. But uh, currently, I carry a satellite phone so I can inform the pilot, you know, how many days you think it will take me to pack it out or whatever, or plan to try to get in based on the weather. So you got that going for you, another communication with somebody, which also helps relieve some of that stress that 
anxiety that people may have. I never had that before. Uh, re recently, I've been carrying a satellite phone. And then the other thing is there's a thing called a bear shocker. There's other product names, but basically it's a, a portable electric fence you can put around your cache of meat wherever you're stashing it when you get back near camp or close to the landing strip or whatever. And you might not be camping right next to it. You might be a ways from, from the meat itself, but at least you don't want the animals to, to get after it because you're supposed to do everything you can to prevent that and everything you can to salvage the meat back back to where you're going to butcher it you know, by law. So by doing this, not against the law not to have it, but to me it's a good idea to have it. And uh, these things are very packable. They come with uh, fiberglass collapsible poles, and you can make a 12 foot uh, by 12 foot square of uh, this electric fence wire that uh, should deter the initial curiosity. And I'm not saying it'll hold a bear off for a long time, but uh, usually for a couple of days anyway, until your pilot can get in there and, and get you guys flown out with your meat. So uh, say you kill a, you kill a bull, you know, in the evening, uh, a couple hours before dark, you, you uh, working that thing up and getting those piles uh, well into, I mean, you don't quit until it's done. Uh, it might be one yeah, o'clock in the morning. I did. You, you wouldn't have to. Some folks don't. Some folks just try to uh, either they gut the bull like you would a deer and to get rid of the, the heat associated with that there's a tremendous amount of heat even though it's cold outside or generally cold outside in alaska you're going to have bone spoil and everything else so uh for me that's what i did um i shot uh one right right at eight o'clock in the evening and uh i got some good video of it and everything you're kind of rushing for time as you're watching the beautiful sunset there and you got your moose down it's just a glorious event but now you better get to working on that that's that's what i did and generally it takes me alone about four hours to skin and and uh and uh, get the the bowl into all the meat deboned or boned that i want and because you're if you're going to do it for taxidermy you ended up kind of caping the animal and you kind of need to cape the, the whole head and face if you're going to cut those antlers off and you need to get the antlers off if you can to roll the ant to roll the moose over so it's a lot of work and and like you said earlier about how do you how did you prepare to go your first time well you shot a lot of deer and stuff like that and knew how to cape the deer and all field dress and field care of the hide and everything else if you want any memories but uh, anyway so i worked up this bull and I think, so, yeah, around 8 o'clock, I think I got back to camp around 12.30 uh, uh, a.m., um, so midnight, a little after midnight, I got back to my camp, you know, just exhausted and stuff. But I had, I didn't get a time to actually move the bags away from the kill site like I described earlier, but at least I had them so that everything was cooling. Yeah. All the meat was cooling overnight and then uh, get back there first thing in the morning and start on it. And, and that's what you call pack day. <laughs> You're packing all day long. Man, that's some calories. Uh, uh, you know, in in yeah. I, I've had the fortune, to, good fortune, to do some of this stuff. Uh, w one thing that jumps out at me, and I'm, I always harp on people, is like safety, because you get to wrestling around an elk or yeah. a, like a moose, and you got a knife yeah. in your hand, and you're tired. Uh, you're by yourself yep. and one wrong move and, uh, you're going to, yeah. you're, you're making memories there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's always in the back, back of my head. It's just slow down, kind of a hyped up guy. If you talk to me or meet me or whatever, you can tell that I can get, uh, really ramped up with emotion a lot of times <laughs> and you hear a lot of it's the chase and go and go no matter what, you know, and the kind of, those attributes are good in uh, certain aspects when you're trying to get after an elk or get out in front of one or get to the top of the hill before he beds or, you know, whatever, you know, but, uh, once you're dealing with this meat and stuff like that, then it's just like, whoo, now just slow everything down, try to slow everything down, just relish the experience. And it's a joyful, it, believe me, it's a joyful time. You're cutting up the moose there, you know, your hunt's over that part of your hunt's over anyway, the kill part, which, you know, of the hunt is usually a matter of minutes or sometimes only seconds of the whole experience and and people focus so much on the kill but i mean the whole hunt includes 
all the anticipation and months and months preparedness ahead of time, which people enjoy and relish. Now you got an animal on the ground, so enjoy it. Take your time. And that's what I do. But you know, you have to be prepared for that. You got to have a flashlight or a headlamp that's going to sustain four hours of continuous use or more uh, intensity. I mean, I have the batteries and stuff to go because if have the, or your light on dim isn't good enough when you want to really focus on where your cuts are and things like that. And you're dealing with huge bulk uh, a moose, so you need the knives and so forth to be able to handle that. And a lot of times a saw if you're dealing with uh, cutting the, the head off. And then you just think about things. That experience I had while I was, I was actually in a unit where you had to bring the animal out on the quarter, so you couldn't bone it out. So you could only bring it out uh, the the meat out on the on the quarters with bone in. So I th- looked at the bull, and the first mistake I made was I looked at it like I would do a whitetail. So I I cut the lower legs off right at the joints, you know, at the knees or at the hocks, you know, which is good. You don't have no hair on the meat and everything. Started skinning and got one side down. But then wait a minute, how am I going to roll this thing over? Well, in the old days, I had those long legs. <laughs> which act as a lever <laughs> yeah. to able me to push it over. Now I cut those legs off. So now I'm having a hard time rolling this thing over without, you know, mechanical advantage that, <laughs> that uh, those legs gave me as a lever. So don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. You know, cut down, leave the legs intact, and then cut the bone off or whatever, you know, on the quarter. And once you get it, you know, all uh, skinned out and uh, pulled and separated from the carcass, either at the at the at the femur and the uh, and uh, the hip, uh, the pelvic uh, joint there, or if you're cutting off the shoulder blade, but be, you know, behind the scapula, and you've cut all the connective tissue behind that, and uh, you know, that's from there. The neck and the brisket and all that's a tremendous amount of of meat. So if you think of just okay, I'm going to put all the meat. You know, if you're boning out in your boning out area, you're putting all the meat from a hind quarter in a bag and stuff, then you get to the neck. Well, a lot of times you end up with like a 120 or 130 pound bag of the neck meat and stuff just because it's like that compartment that you visualize. Well, now I'm going to get the neck and put, throw it in a bag. Well, better pay attention because those bags can get heavy real quick. <laughs> so, so. First off, there's there's some place that you and I differ because I'm kind of like a go 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 guy when I'm in the woods. When I kill something, especially a, an elk, uh, it's a <laughs> you're saying enjoy it, man. I'm just like you got to be kidding me. I get so tense. <laughs> I get so tense because yeah. it's like you got to get it done, right? I get so tense, yeah. my back knots up, um, and I'm oh just, yeah, <laughs> I'm just like oh. I'm not saying I wasn't <laughs> sucking down a bunch of Advil when I get back to camp, but. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny that's funny um first off like uh you know working up a moose what kind of knives uh and and how many uh do you got one you know heavy sheath knife you using to to uh cut the get through the joints um and then yeah uh what, what do you got there for i knives? just for like old school i bought like when i was in high school a buck it's got a long thin blade and so you can it's called a buck buck pathfinder and it's a sheath knife that I've used just about on all my uh, trips. And I have a belt knife, a folding uh, Chicago cutlery that I've used for 35 years. And the, those two knives is what I used on every game, just about every game animal I've killed. And yeah, well, what's your other knives? But for some reason, when it comes time to go, I just bring those. Some of the real wide bladed knives, um, you know, you can't rotate them as much as a longer, thinner knife. Mm-hmm. That's if you look up the profile of a, the Buck Pathfinder, you see what I'm talking about. It's long enough. It holds an edge good. And uh, and I also carry a, a small steel with me. So I'm stealing the knife as I go and skinning. Yeah. But that's, that's what I've used. I know guys want to stay sharp with these uh, disposable blades, like razor blade things and stuff like that. But uh, uh, I'm not so familiar with them and that goes back to my old school stuff it's like well it worked before so hopefully it'll work again so i don't change much it's kind of like how i'm shooting my bows and my arrows and stuff like that 20 22 19 aluminum arrows since 
since 1976. Just about. <laughs> he broke, yeah, don't fix it, huh? Don't, about the only arrows I use. <laughs> I use some wood, but mostly I'm using those. What? Uh, that's a heck of a bunch of game bags to bring in the field. You know, typically when I'm elk hunting, yeah. I've got four game bags and, and typically yeah, the, so you need to have at least nine with you for a moose what and, kind? Uh, and you're carrying them with you or whatever. I used to use, you can use pillowcase or whatever, but uh, I found that you get more use and more durability out of the, uh, uh, caribou yeah. caribou gear, I guess is the name of it. I use those now, and then I, I get them home, rinse the blood out of them, throw them in a bucket uh, with light uh, bleach uh, in there, let them soak, and rinse them out, and then just run them through the rinse again and dry them, and they're good good to go again. It's, they're a pretty good product. It's it's one thing that's always uh, that's great, man. I don't see it as much or hear about it as much now, but uh, people that go in the field, again, uh, talk spe- specifically for elk, and if you're not ready to work up an animal right then, especially we know when you're hunting yeah. in September, you got no business being out there. I mean, you got to have your game bags yeah. ready to roll. And elk hunting is a little different too. You have a, a, more of a tendency, uh, like the way the bow season is, to find uh, yourself into some pretty warm weather. Yeah. And so, we're, but Alaska, you have less of that. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but you have just less of that. And uh, also learning from Monty Browning and uh, Brian Burkhardt. I've never had the opportunity to do this, but they uh, they always, I mean, they do it on purpose, put their meat uh, in the in a stream. You know, they get it wet. They put it right in the water to cool it and keep the scent away and uh, all, mainly cool the, um, cool the meat, and they put it right in the streams. Yeah. And um, I so had, that's I, something, if they can do it in Alaska, you can – certainly do it uh in colorado and stuff I hopefully you find that right uh, uh, scenario or circumstance but in the old days i always thought the bacteria is with water you know you use salt to draw to draw moisture osmosis and draw uh, the water out of the bacteria out of the hide and and stuff and that's you know that's why you're preserving it and so then to put it in water i always thought to keep things you know, dry, you know, you don't want water, but uh, the, in the cool streams in Alaska, that's what the, these guys do. Um, I had, but uh, yeah, the game bags, and that's why people see me in my videos, and I usually, I've been using a, a, a bison gear wool pack. It's quiet, even though I was sponsored and kind of, uh, not necessarily sponsored, but I was uh, game, uh, field testing and part of the athlete staff or Sitka gear and their packs. But uh, I found that the bison gear just worked better for my purposes of uh, filming. And it's just more quiet because of the wool mainly and just how the shape of that pack. And I just got used to it. So I always still kept using the, the bison gear pack. But it, my point is that it's large to hold, handle the, the camera equipment and, and my survival stuff. And also the game bags. So it goes back to your point. You better be prepared to, um, to to work up the animal when you get there. And if you're hunting moose, you're talking nine game bags. And so I won't necessarily every time bring all nine, but I'm bringing some. And uh, like you could lay out a quarter on a piece of uh, plastic or let it cool until you can get back to it. And I know other folks like Brian, I talk with him and a lot of times they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't have their game uh, processing stuff with them. They'd have time to go back. But again, they're not alone. You know, he's usually has a hunting partner with him and so forth. And uh, they can get it done quicker in the morning versus somebody that's by himself that you're not going to get any help. There's no one to call. You can't call the Jeep. There's, there's no one coming. It's just you. So, um, that's why I look like, holy cow, this guy's gi- carrying this giant day pack with him <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> on some of the film footage that, that you see of me. And uh, that's one of the reasons. Sometimes I guess I'm too prepared. My friend uh, Steve Osminski would say, this guy is more prepared <laughs> He's to go to war than anything. You're gonna be always prepared for anything. And I guess it's just, you know, how do you alleviate that fear of being alone, of, of the hypothermia, of getting wet? And it's, it's, it's how do you alleviate that fear, some sort of preparedness. And so I bring enough gear to uh, 
to to allow me to go out alone. I bring out enough stuff to vanquish that fear that I can go out alone. You know, uh, to to meet care um, a few years ago. Uh, using those Florida sh- shelters, um, I ended up packing uh, some Tyvek, you know, a strip, a strip mm-hmm. of Tyvek, and uh, we killed killed a deer, me and my buddy, and and it was cold, but the uh, there was no snow on the ground, so you know you hate to get meat. You know, I'm pretty fanatical about keeping the meat clean. Threw out that Tyvek and was able to uh, to utilize it to work some of the meat up. We bagged it, got it back to camp uh and and put it out on a log we were in a backpack camp put it out on a log and it started to uh rain and snow and stuff and so i took that tyvek and draped it over the meat so it could still get air under it uh wow that was that was an eye opener that tyvek can be uh yeah can be pretty valuable i liked it yes and there is it's cheap and there's also different grades you can get a lighter grade that do the same purpose that we want we're not talking about, you know, uh, putting it on a house and, and all that and stopping wind for 50 years or whatever like they have, but there's different grades of it that are thinner and a little bit slightly more quieter. And uh, I try to order that if I can find it, and it's usually, you know, a pretty good section of it for 30 bucks compared to some of the other high-end uh, tarps and things that you that they uh, advertise so yeah it's a good idea where actually i had this uh, kefaru tent and i put that in the thinner tyvek under it to uh it's like a liner that they put under uh under the walls huh. to uh deflect uh, condensation because it's, it's a single wall tent the, oh, the yeah. kefaru uh, uh sawtooth oh. is yep. what i uh, is what i use and so you get a lot of moisture in the tent because it's an open, there's no floor in it. So there's, and I didn't use a, a stove. They're designed to be run with a, a stove in, in colder weather. So you're going to get condensation. So you, you do pretty much need the liner, but uh, I used the Tyvek for that. But the one year I used, I couldn't, I didn't get the, the, the thinner stuff. And I got the regular stuff that they put on houses. And it comes in a pretty compressed little packet all folded up. Oh, it fits perfect in my luggage and stuff. I get out there. But once I, you know, unroll it and start to tie it inside the tent, that stuff is super noisy. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you better have, be able to sleep well if you hear that rattle in the wind all night. But uh, anyway. Well, it's, it'd be good bear deterrent, too, every time you roll over. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so first off, I didn't realize there was different grades. And what I use is the actual house wrap. <laughs> Um, mm-hmm. so were you just using that on the floor with your sawtooth or were you actually using it, um, on the walls? I tied it up on the top. I, I used oh, the thinner yeah. stuff. And even last time with the regular tie back, I, you tie it, um, on the strings, the string eyelets inside the top, uh, seam, the roof seam. And then it, it just drapes down. Uh, and then there's other eyelet eyelets, uh, or, uh, t- tie outs inside the tent so it's giving you essentially a double layer of uh above your face yeah above your equipment you just mainly only need it on the side that you're sleeping on because you get condensation and drip in those in oh those yeah sometimes people don't talk so much about it because they're usually running stoves and a lot of people do have those the liners i guess they call it I, a baffle or something i don't know it's a liner but it's designed to go inside there so it's double walled so you get the airflow and air movement that you normally would, like a teepee, but you also kind of need that if you're, you know, you're able to stand in these tents. I can stand in them, but you know, maybe take a step or so. But and then your shoulders and your neck and head brushes against this, you know, you're touching the side of the tent and and all the condensation from the night, you know, because you generally have, uh, you know, cool nights and rain and stuff like that in Alaska almost every night. So you need that. So that's so, but. Um, I guess it's going back to being being cheap or whatever, but getting things done. <laughs> but that's what I used for that. Oh man! Uh, and to finish off the whole solitude thing, uh, you know, when you do, uh, uh, when you're out there by yourself and you get her all done, and and uh, at the end of the trip, I, I got to, Well, I know it, it is such a rewarding uh, feeling. Like you know, you just went and did something and only relied on your skills, and you know, you got her done by yourself. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's part of the reward. Yep, that's part of it. And, um, it's just uh, 
I guess the idea of chasing solitude came from an article I wrote about Bart Schleier, and it seemed like he was uh, moved from Wyoming to Montana and was hunting in Montana and stuff. And then as he graduated from college and stuff, worked for the fishing game, he moved to Alaska, and then uh, he'd hunt out from there. And he would every time he would encounter somebody, and then he he like it's like he wouldn't want to go back to that spot because he saw somebody. So he's still trying to find an area where he could go and hunt sheep and moose or whatever and not see a single person. And so in my mind, it's like he was, you know, the chasing solitude. He kept moving from Wyoming to Montana to Alaska to the Yukon to, you know, so it's like and he hunt, you know, he not hunt, but he moved to, to, to Russia and stuff for a while working with his, uh, with his livelihood of large animal capture. But uh, during his hunting aspect, it seemed like he was just chasing a spot where he would never encounter anybody. He would walk in like 20 miles or so to get up from a, from a landing strip up to the high country to hunt doll sheep. And if he f- saw somebody else there who found a, a easier spot to land or a closer spot to land, then he'd be out of there and, and looking for another spot. <laughs> So you knew him, um, you knew him, uh, kind of on a friendship level then? Yeah. Yeah. It's more friendship level than anything. And, uh, I met him a few times, but, uh, mainly a, a friend of mine, Dan Foster out of, uh, Foster's taxidermy in Wasilla. He was a good friend with, the, uh, with the Dan. He used to work in the taxidermy shop there during the off season. So that was my app, and then he he knew uh, Paul Schaefer was friends with him, and so the connection between Paul Schaefer and the Winslow brothers also aligned with with me. So I kind of knew about him and knew him through that. So when I was in Alaska, you know, Dan would say, "Hey, it's a phone call, and it's for you, Mike." And so I go, "It's for me. No one even knows I'm here." <laughs> and it would be Bart, you know, because he would tell he would tell uh, Bart that I was coming up and stuff. So. And they kind of make full circle to what you said earlier. Here's a guy from Illinois who's basically in the suburbia between Chicago and Milwaukee, finds himself in the middle of the bush in Alaska, you know, chasing, you know, moose and bear or whatever you could hunt alone without a guide in Alaska. And, you know, for two to three weeks at a time. And so those things, those stories would funnel down to Bart through, through, um, to Dan Foster and stuff, and so that's why he would say, "Man, you know, I admire what you do because you know, you know, basically, I live up here. You know, I do this all the time. You know, this is my livelihood. You know, so I'm, I'm always in the bush and the Bob Marshall and Montana to up here and, and dealing with the bears and Kodiak and so forth and whatever. But for a guy like you to come up from the city <laughs> and go out here in the bush by yourself, you know." It's a whole different uh, thing that he says I can't wrap my head around too well. <laughs> you know, anyway, it's kind of a joke, but I mean, it's um, it's kind of uh, letting people know that we can do it, that we have uh, responsibilities down here. You're in the cities or you're around uh, the Midwest or whatever, and you're living where you live because that's your livelihood and you're making your money and then your freedom that we have in this country uh to go and do where you want, go go where you want, and go into the bush if you want is uh, is all up to you. And so it can be done. So that's sort of the inspirational thing that I gathered from Bart and and uh, Paul Schaefer and stuff, the guys that lived out there. To a guy like me, that I'm just doing this on my basically my vacation, and I got to come back home then, you know, to Illinois where where we have one one big game species, the white-tailed deer. <laughs> Whereas you go to Montana or Alaska and stuff, there's 10, there's 10 things to hunt, you know, or whatever. You know, they, they have a lot longer season and they're chasing, you know, in the case of Montana, antelope and goats and sheep and bear and different species of deer and, and everything else. But uh, here we just have one, so I'm kind of limited to that. And uh, so it's hard for me, hard to learn. And his was his point. It was like you only get one quick exposure a year almost you know, two weeks or a week or two or whatever, and then you're then you're not here. So it's hard to gain that. You know, how do you get through your apprenticeship? And I guess it goes back to what you were saying even earlier. How did you get to the point of learning and having enough uh, confidence and self-reliance and woodsmanship skill 
when you're in the Midwest, uh, you know, in suburbia. And so I guess my story, I guess, helps other folks to say, hey, you can do it. There is a path. It might not be written. There might not be a template or an outline. But uh, if you find your own way and you're, and you're motivated, uh, you can get there. Well, you know, I, you could sum it up, and I, and I say this uh, tongue-in-cheek, the only thing holding anybody back is fear and common sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I hear that a lot, folks. They're, they're mostly afra- afraid of the bears. And then you don't want to uh, not jinx yourself or whatever. But, yeah, you, I have respect for them and stuff. But I guess it's also like, you know, driving a car in the city you know it's like how can you drive a car down down to you know, the interstates going down through chicago and all that you know well once you've done it a couple of times then you get more familiar with it and then it becomes easier and so basically solo hunting is start out slow and do it a few times you know a three-day weekend a five-day a seven-day and you just build on it and the step stepwise well, you know, uh, not to belabor the subject, but, you know, you mentioned a uh, length of time, three days to uh, three weeks. Uh, I'm not capable, you know, mentally. I, I do, if I'm three days, four days uh, by myself, um, you know, not even like, not even backpacking, just three days up in the mountains by myself. Uh, it doesn't really work mentally for me. I mean, I, I'm a people person uh, as much as I like to think I'm an introvert. Uh, it's, that's, that's not easy. Uh, to mentally yeah, just to hang I don't I don't for everybody yeah I don't like myself enough to hang out with just me for three or four days <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah that's what I try to say it's not you know it's not for everyone for that's for sure and it's only certain people are uh, cut for it and um, I don't know I just it's okay you know, you're breaking a lot of the rules that we learned in Boy Scouts the buddy system and all that you're breaking all those rules so you got to get past all that. Uh, what, but uh, what about, for me, I'm sort of a day a daydreamer, sort of, and you can tell that from some of my writing. And uh, and then so some guys, was, I, was re, I was listening to a guy's podcast, and he had to have his electronics, his phone and all that, where he was watching or listening to some stuff that he was connected to in his tent during, a, during the times that you get socked in, either by weather or fog or whatever. But for me, I would just, I usually just bring a little pad of paper and a pen. And so if I ever get locked or socked in, you know, like the whole day or something like that, then uh, I usually write, you know, start to write, write things. And uh, so I can take myself into a different spot where I'm not really there. And I'm, I really am with people. I, would, I would write an article about hunting kudu in Africa with my friend Aaron. And I'm writing an article about, or a story, or a chapter, uh, writing about Africa hunting kudu when I'm socked in in a tent, you know, all day in the middle of Alaska. So I guess those are the, the tools that I use to to get past uh, this um, uh, the boredom and the the, 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 the isolation. Whereas when I'm running around hunting, I'm occupied. My brain is occupied, and I'm I'm not uh, I'm not missing. Uh, not missing the hustle and bustle of the world. And I'm, and I'm using that as to, uh, to rejuvenate. Um, Fred bear kind of said it, uh, isolation, hunting alone and stuff, cleanse the soul. And, uh, for me, I don't know, sort of in, imply that your soul is dirty, <laughs> but for me, it's a, a re- rejuvenation. It's, uh, uh, resolution time to make resolutions like some folks make their new year's resolution or how they want to do better in life and so forth you know you know around the first of the year but for me it's uh, when i'm in when i'm alone and stuff like that you have time to think about all the all those relationships that you have you know and i had you know a good wife and uh to, to give me this gift of time to go to go do these things as i you know as i as i raised uh, five kids so um anyway that you know you you just uh the card has to be in the cards i guess try it you know like you say a little at a time so uh when you talk about solo filming and and uh um you know you talk about like you know with me um you know needing some interaction after three or four days you, you gotta feel like when you're solo filming you're 
you are talking to somebody, right? Because you're putting your camera yeah, up. Yeah, that's what I did get to that point. But uh, um, when I do have the camera there, in the old days, I wouldn't film as much. And, I, you know, I wasn't uh, I just film and stuff. But then once I decided to make a uh, film for a production or put it out there, then I am, uh, you know, getting some dialogue and capturing that. And and uh, then the... I guess it's like uh, Tom Hanks in uh, <laughs> in that movie he was in, uh, Castaway or whatever. Yeah. He's talking to a daggone uh, soccer ball, volleyball, or yeah, something. volleyball. You're, you're right. Know. Yeah, Wilson. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Wilson. You know, so uh, Will. So my camera is named Wilson now. <laughs> you know. So, but anyway, I'm I'm talking to the camera because that's the whole thing about solitude and everything, and what defines us as humans and things. It's communication and and verbal talk. You know. And to, being able to talk so once once you talk you kind of broken that um that uh, string of isolation and a lot of guys they'll bring a satellite phone and some of them will, will talk to their wives or girlfriends or somebody or at home almost every night you know to alleviate their fear and everything well then they're they're communicating they're talking so once a day they're they're breaking that <laughs> And so for me, not doing that and going for a week at a time, that's when I get into this spiritual side of things and not saying a word or communicating with any other human being, even uh, figuratively, if it's, if you talk about the camera, uh, then I would go, like you say, 14 days, you know, and more, and then it's getting into the 20, 21 days, you know, without ever seeing another human being. And sometimes I would just say a word just to kind of make sure your voice works <laughs> but uh if you see in the videos and if you know anything about moose hunting i mean i'm doing a lot of calling so i'm i am physically vocalizing but uh the actual communication part is what uh, it hinders most folks and that's the reason they get so lonesome or whatever but with a camera there or you have a satellite phone and stuff like that a lot of folks can get by this uh that con continuous break because they're, they've interrupted that that sequence of of being alone by by t by calling home either every night or every other night or something. When you get back, uh, when you get picked up after you know twenty days or something, uh, and you start talking to the pilot, you get into town and you go to the store. Uh, is that kind of kind of tough to take all those noises and the and the hustle and bustle around you? Yeah, sometimes it is. Yeah, depending on how long you're in there, but usually I lose a lot of weight and stuff. And I remember at one one trip we were talking about what we were going to eat when we get home and have a big pizza and a meal or something like that because, you know, get rid of this mountain house or freeze-dried food or jerky or nuts and stuff and have, you know, a big steak, you know. And you'd come into town and you'd get to that meal, and, boy, you couldn't even eat you know, a quarter of the pizza when you used to be able to eat a whole pizza. <laughs> you couldn't eat. Your stomach is shrunk up and, and uh, you can't eat. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, the, then getting back to work that first day, either you don't kill anything or you do or whatever. And a lot of people, they don't understand that. And, and that's one of the things I would do, you know, bring these stories to coworkers that don't hunt and stuff. And then they would hear the you know, the, the reaccount of some of somewhat of what I did during my vacation type of thing. And the other would be through the writing and the, and the film that they could visualize it better, but uh, just telling those stories and then getting to the bottom line and saying, and, uh, you know, I didn't come back with anything. I didn't kill anything. And what, you know, you were gone that long and you didn't kill anything. I go, yes, but you know, I saw the big guy or I saw, you know, I had this experience and that, you know, and, and so that's part of the stories, but, uh, that we can do even as, as bow hunters, you know, I try to find success in every, every trip, every adventure is, is successful. If you, if you redefine your notion of success, if your notion of success is an animal laying on the ground, um, then, uh, uh, your rewards is, is going to be few and far between. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. Um, so uh, what what bow are you shooting uh, these days? Uh, I have a, a lot of recurves, mostly all 64-inch recurves. I don't shoot any long bows. Most of them are takedowns and stuff, but uh, I have been shooting tall tines uh -huh. uh, recently, but I've also liked Brackenberry and West Wallace, and I have a few Black Widows and so forth. I have a, a Stalker uh, uh, 
South Cox made a commemorative bowl uh, called the Wolverine, uh, and he made a wood combination and so forth in commemoration of Bart Schleier. He called it the Schleier model. I have one of those that I've shot uh, shot moose with, and uh, and currently um, he did stalker stick bow South Cox made a a commemorative bow similar to the woods of a bow that I made myself. It's a babinga uh, riser with babinga veneers on a 64 inch platform, and uh, he calls it the herd bow. Ooh. So he made ten of them. It's kind of an honor for them guys to do that. Him and uh, D&M Custom uh, Arrows, oh, Gary yeah. Hall, as well as Selway Quiver, put together a, a herd bowl package, they call it. So they made arrows similar to what I use, 2219s with the fletching combinations, four fletch, five inches long that I use, and then, uh, and then a straight um, long risered uh, uh, stalker. Uh, stick bow, herd bow pattern. I guess they made uh, about 10 of them and uh, they put them online last year and uh, I guess they sold out in 24 hours. So. <laughs> they, uh, kind of, uh, they kind of did it as a tribute to to my works and so forth, but kind of humbling. So I've been shooting that bow this year. But uh, I like the I like uh, Tall Times Brian Wessel's bows. I think he sold Tall Times the company, and hopefully Mike will get that uh, company going again. But uh, otherwise, I, I I shot the Tall Times in the last maybe seven to seven years or so. Well, you know, you just mentioned it's humbling, and uh, I got to say, for a guy that's done so much in, in a world that's uh, so braggadocious, uh, you uh, you've done some. Uh, for the for the lack of a better term, some badass stuff, and you are very humble about it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, sometimes my girlfriends and so a girlfriend doesn't uh, appreciate that part. You're just doing that to show your buddies you're getting a big head. <laughs> so my wife the same way. I lost her in uh, 2009, and uh, so yeah, it's. Um, it's human nature to tell the stories and try to show what you do and and um the bragging part is is tough and it's kind of always been hard for me with the doing the um promotion of the videos and promotion of your book and then it turns into self promotion without people either somebody like you or or Tim from the push or something like that that can help you uh, get the word out then then you are promoting your own works then you are self-promoting and so it kind of goes against the grain of what we're about <laughs> yeah yeah so it's it's hard you want to get it out there and stuff but uh, yeah well um, i liked what you said you know when when you uh when you did the uh, podcast with with tim over at the push you know you mentioned uh something about you as a younger guy wanting to draw the stories out of people uh, and and now you're the guy that younger guys are trying to draw the story out of, out of you know you, um, mm-hmm. and and it is it's a it, when you put it in that perspective it kind of like it, it struck me I was like yeah, uh, and and I speaking for me I feel very fortunate to uh, you know to be able to sit down and chat with you or uh, you know any number of other people that are in my phone now it's like I've, I've gotten to sit down yeah. and pull these stories out and share them with people I feel fortunate. Um, for sure. Yeah, it, it's uh, that's initially when we talked about this podcast, I was sort of thanking you guys because you're like the liaison between the old and and the, and the new, uh, the past and the present type of thing. You guys are playing an important role. Prior to that, you just had uh, uh, publishers and ma- magazine publishers that were doing that. Basically, you, know, you mentioned M. R. James and and. T.J. Conrad's and uh, um, yeah, and others that publish ma- magazines. You know, I remember being in high school. You know, in the connection to the outdoors. You know, you want to be outside and you can't. You're inside. You go to the library. Well, what did I do? I, I put in requests for magazines. I go, you don't have this magazine. Can you order it? They said, what is it? And I said, it's called Fur Fish and Game. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so the high school 
library would then order in fur fish and game and i would read fur fish and game or bow hunter magazine and you know and they'd have some old copies there and i'd read all that and that's my my exposure you know to the past or to to learn and and, and hopefully you guys are doing that now with uh, the connection to us yeah so absolutely. We, as as we lose people or people you know uh get out of it or you know um come on the end of their trail so to speak uh, the legacies need to be held. You know, we have Gene Wenzel and Barry, and a lot of the younger guys don't necessarily know those guys, but but through but through the podcasters, <laughs> that's their only experience. And you mentioned Brothers of the Boat earlier, and uh, hopefully people will take the time to check out uh, Gene and Barry and what they're up to and so forth. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, and kind of in that um, regard, man, I, I got to say thank you for doing what you what you do, what you continue to, do, what you've done and what you continue to do because, uh, inspiring people to, uh, uh, try to take it to the next level and push themselves and, uh, just sharing the passion. Um, it's, it's, it's not just one thing that's going to continue, uh, hunting and bow hunting and, and traditional bow hunting. It's, it's all of those. So I appreciate what you've done. And, um, if anybody needs some inspiration, beyond this podcast <laughs> uh, tell them to go to herd bull uh productions the your book one in the wilderness one with the wilderness uh can get a guy pretty fired up to uh throw a pack on and go challenge themselves and uh for sure yep and thank you so much yeah yeah hey thanks for the time and i look forward to working with you uh comptons and uh, hopefully shaking your hand there june 17th over in uh Berrien springs yeah. So any folks that want to talk or meet up there, I should be there. I, I won't be in the Brothers of the Bow booth or the Herd Bull Productions booth, but I'll probably be at the merchandising, Compton merchandising booth. So come and find me there. <laughs> it's going to be a working vacation for you. Yeah. And me as yeah. well. Well, <laughs> say vacation. Um, once I got my knees done, you know, paid for, uh, paid for and got feeling pretty good. And then I looked at the, uh, the COVID uh, restrictions of all last year. And um, so uh, I retired in November. This last so, November? Yeah. Wow. So after 36 and a half years in the pharmaceutical discovery of uh, anti-infectives or cancer therapeutics, I decided to retire. So... Wow. Uh, Comptas uh, will just be another day for me. It won't be a vacation. It'll just be another day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Well, congr yeah, congratulations on retirement. And uh, that sounds like a, uh, that's, that's not a, that's not a redneck uh, occupation. What you just rattled off there. <laughs> mm -hmm. No. no. Uh, I mean, yeah, you kind of feel that way when I go to work sometimes, but uh, <laughs> uh, I did meet, you know, a lot of people, a lot of, uh, scientists and stuff chemists and stuff and they uh they have no experience whatsoever with uh, with hunting and stuff but when i bring in summer sausage or moose from alaska or uh, what have you deer jerky or whatever uh yeah you know, they're into that you know and they and that starts the story you know and uh, you can make that connection and they may not want to do it or whatever, but at least they have an exposure and maybe you know, it's time to vote or whatever. They vote to allow us to continue what we do if they have a better understanding of it. Absolutely. Uh, well said and um, awesome. I appreciate your time, Mike. Okay. See you later, Rob. Uh, have a good day. Thank you so much.